All right, well, thanks for coming. Um, take two. Uh, my name is Matthew Landauer. Uh, I'm one of the founders and um, the main developer behind uh, Open Australia, uh, which is a website I'm going to tell you a bit about. But first, kind of take a little detour. But obviously, the title is Data and Democracy, and it's about you know what happens when you take a whole lot of government data, uh, mix it up with democracy, and the, the, the sorts of things that can happen from that. So. Um, this guy, this grumpy looking guy, is uh, Winston Churchill, who was the uh, UK Prime Minister during the Second World War. Um, and he had a very famous thing to say about democracy, where he said, it's been said that democracy is the very worst form of government, um, except all the others that have been tried. Um, now, democracy is a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people, but um, you know, we need to remind ourselves about the true nature of democracy. And, and democracy isn't just what goes on in this building. Um, you're probably familiar with this. It's the um, federal parliament in Canberra, and um, this is the House of Representatives without the people in it. Um, and we're, I guess we're all used to kind of pictures of, you know, seeing debates go on in parliament and maybe question time and that whole kind of theater. Um, but, you know, we need to remember that they're there uh, representing us, right? And people, ordinary people, uh, people like us are 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 there, you know, are the they're there as the voice of us, basically. So so we need to remember our role in all of this, and and to do that, I'm going to just take a little sort of sidestep and look at um, the UK. As you're probably familiar, you know, the system in Australia is very much modelled after the UK system, and 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 I'm going to tell you a bit about the publishing of the the Proceedings of Parliament, which is the, called the Hansard. Now, if you go back to the 18th century, it's, it's, it's extraordinary to think, in today's terms, that what, it was actually illegal to publish what was said in Parliament. Like, you could be jailed for doing that. It was, it was legal to report the results of the kind of discussions, so you could, you know, there were publishers, they published, you know, what the votes were, and what bills got passed and that sort of thing. But to actually publish the debate um, was illegal. Now the idea was that, that there was some, you know, you need, they needed that privacy to, to, to kind of uh, allow that discussion to happen freely. And publishing it would somehow undermine that. Now, that, that sort of argument might, might remind you of some of the arguments that are going on now around freedom of information. You know, similar sorts of things. Um, but, but now, if we look at things now, it's pretty unthinkable to think that this situation ever existed. Um, but, you know, people being people, they got around it, right? So, so they published these things called the Proceedings of the Lower Room of the Robin Hood Society, which was this completely fictional account of, of this fictional house that said these fictional things, but was really a thinly veiled, you know, actual account of what happened. And, and this went on for some time, and I think, and I think there were a few kind of big court cases, and I think it all culminated in a court case in 1771, where, where, where after that point it was sort of tolerated. Like I don't think it was specifically legalized at that point, but, but, but it was, you know, uh, I don't think people were being prosecuted. Now move the clock forward, and I think uh, at the beginning of the 20th century in the UK. Um, the, the publication of the proceedings of Parliament was officially taken over by Parliament itself. And in Australia, as far as I'm aware, that's, it's always been the case that, that Australian Parliament uh, has published those proceedings. So, so they're probably, you know, initially they were always published in this, this book form, you know. Um, these are debates from the House of Representatives in 1941, I think. Um, but, you know, time moves on and not everybody has the ability to go to Canberra and look at these books. And thankfully, um, uh, the Parliament House set up a website and they put the Hansard online, which is great. And I'm not entirely sure when this actually happened. Um, but those records go back to around 1981, roughly around then. Um, now, that's sort of the point at which kind of Open Australia Join the fray, and um, and basically uh, we saw what what a, a group in the UK had done 
um, a, a group called My Society, and they set up a website called They Work For You, which basically uh, republishes the UK Hansard. And we were like very excited about this, and we wanted to bring that to Australia. So um, basically, we built on what, what they'd done. The, all the source code behind their site is um, open source, and we basically adapted it to, to uh, Australia. I kind of, I spent, I think, a, a, a week prototyping it. Like, I, 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 the company I was working for at the time in November 2007 had a charity leave scheme, and, and I could take the charity leave for a week um, to, to work on this thing. So I basically just kind of threw a very, very rough early version of the thing together. Um, and that resulted in Open Australia. So the, the main difference between Open Australia and the, and the original site is that it's just, it presents the same information, but in a, in a much more kind of usable, easy to search, uh, easy to keep up to date with kind of form. So, so um, you, can do, you can do things like, you know, you just put in your postcode and, and it will then tell you who your representative is, and then with one click you can get email updates of whenever they speak in Parliament. Sort of really simple, obvious kind of stuff that, that at the time was completely missing from the official uh, official website. Uh, search works. It, it used to be that the search on um, Parliament House website was completely horrific, like unbearably bad. Um, you couldn't find anything. Um, it has improved since then, and I'll go into, I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, and, and, and you can do kind of keyword searches, so you know, if you're interested in a particular subject, uh, be it environment or uh, internet or whatever, you can get email updates for those kind of keywords. All pretty obvious stuff, right? Um, but when you bring that to, to what gets said in Parliament, it kind of allows, it, 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 it completely changes the nature of, of, of how you engage with your, your elected representative, right? Because Normally, right, there's, 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 there's a few different ways that you could find out what they're up to, right? You could listen, you could go to their website and, and read their press releases and see what they're proud of, right? Or you could uh, read the newspapers or watch TV, and you'd probably not hear anything about your elected representative as all, at all, right? So this is a way in which you can not only find out about what particular people are doing, but also kind of narrow it down to what your particular interests are. It's like... Um, you know, I kind of, yeah, it's, 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 it's obvious. Um, so this is, this is an example of, um, you know, a particular MP's page. So I put in my postcode, I live in the Blue Mountains, so uh, Bob Debus comes up and, um, you know, you get a few kind of facts about him. Um, you can, you know, click and get email me whenever he speaks and see his most recent speeches and some kind of biographical links off to things. Um, and... And you know this is a kind of starting point, and this is also a place where you can actually read about uh, the register of members' interests. So that tells you about um, you know the uh, uh, any bank accounts that they have, you know gifts that they might have received, stuff like that. So so it, this the idea is to kind of you know over time, as more and more information becomes available, and um, we we put more of that kind of stuff here. So there's there's also some kind of automatic stuff that's that's garnered from the speeches, like you know how often they've spoken in Parliament, which is kind of interesting. Um, you know the kind of average reading age of their language that they use, you know, which is surprisingly interesting. And you know there's little little things in there um, to just kind of pique your interest um, and make you look a little deeper. So because you know. Truth is that most people don't really know who their representative is, and and don't really have any particular direct way to easily find out and and learn anything that that they'd be interested in learning about. Now, um, okay, so that's one thing. But I'm going to move on to uh, another kind of probably probably bigger, really bigger reason that um, Open Australia is needed, and this relates to Google actually. Now. I've got this quote, right? I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you probably guessed it's something to do with Parliament and something to do with what a politician said. But um, yeah, so the, a global network of volunteers who develop the Ubuntu Linux system, right? I stick it into into this thing, and and I get some results. And there's only five of them, and the first one is actually it's a slight nice self-referential thing because I actually used this once in a talk before, so that's the first <laughs> the first one. But after that, um, it's from Catherine King. Uh, and uh, a link to Open Australia. So 
Catherine King is an MP, and she said that, and this is her website. Um, and she's actually reprinted her, her speech on the website, which is actually pretty unusual. So, so you'd use, if you did a random you know, search for a bit of text that was said in Parliament, you would probably not see the, 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 the politician's website turn up. So, um, The other link is the Open Australia one, you know, and, and, you know, and, it's, and she's actually talking about, about um, uh, a guy, you know, I think it's the National Broadband Network, and she's talking about a guy working remotely on, on, on developing Linux, you know, and that he needs high bandwidth. So that's why it's mentioned. But you're probably been paying attention. And the official source of this information, Parliament House, is actually completely missing from the search results. So, so the official source, online source, is not being indexed by Google. Now, I have no doubt whatsoever that's nothing to do with Google. It's to do with the way that they set up their website. I haven't found a robots.txt file or anything that looks like they're intentionally stopping that stuff being spidered. But it just doesn't appear. You can do a search for, for, for just about anything that's said in Parliament, and it doesn't appear in search results. So, so that's a pretty poor situation, really. Well, considering that's the record of what politicians are saying on our behalf, and it's not appearing in Google searches, or any searches for that matter. Right? So, so what it means is you're completely limiting people's ability to, 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 discover, to discover things, right? Rather than going, ooh, I wonder what my politician is saying about X, you know? Rather they do a search on, oh, I'm interested in finding out about, you know, this person that's just died in an accident, in an industrial accident or something. And, and then they find out, you know, then they should find out that it's actually been talked about in Parliament. But you would never, that would just never happen. So it's all, you know, Um, so, I, I hope I hope that that they can fix the situation. Like whatever they're doing wrong, like not having sitemaps, XML sitemaps, or whatever it is that's the trouble. Um, you know, whether well, it could be any number of things. And it's not hard. You know, you guys have made it really easy to make things searchable. So they need to do their bit. Um, now. You're probably wondering who is behind Open Australia apart from me. Um, but basically, we're um, just a, a, a bunch of technology geeks, right? Um, this is a sort of core group. Um, we're, we're all doing this um, in our own time. Um, we're all volunteers. We're not being paid to do this. Um, we're doing it because we think it's important. Um, and, uh, you know, um, and it's important and it needs to be done well, really. Um, a really key part of what we're doing is that it's totally nonpartisan, right? It's about providing information to people for people to make their own choices. Like, we're not, we don't editorialize the information in any way. We don't manipulate it in a way that, that, that alters its meaning in any shape or form, right? It's all about presenting the information in its, in its purest, true way. Um, all the software that runs our website is open source, right? That's that's not just a, a pragmatic, yeah, we like open source, which we do, but it's actually, it's actually a really key thing, right? We're, we're, about, we're about transparency. We're about saying, oh, government needs, we need to know what government's doing. We need to know what politicians are saying, but people need to trust what we're doing. And the only way to, for, us, for us to really make what we're doing trustworthy is obviously we say the right words. We say, we say yeah, we're nonpartisan, but people need to be able to look at the source code that runs a website and see that we're not doing anything fishy, right? So that's really, really key. Now, um, we need to make this stuff sustainable. Like right now, you know, we're doing it, we're doing it unpaid. Um, uh, I'm probably spending far more time doing it than I really should. Um, and <laughs> um, on the level of being paid, that is. But, um, but one of the key things, I guess, to, to, to make this thing work for the long term, and it's important that this thing works the long term, is that we actually set up a nonprofit and we try to get funding to kind of maintain this thing and actually try to get a very small group of core uh, paid developers together to, to maintain this thing and to build stuff for the future, you know? Because, like, what we've done right now is just, is really just the beginning. A um, whole bunch of people to thank. These are some of the people that have contributed the code, except for me, and, and um, 
Our hosting is, is provided by um, a guy called Andrew Snow from Oct Octopus Computing, who's basically got a, 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 a machine on a rack some, in some sort of a room in Sydney, and he's given me uh, a, VPS, a VPS on it, and so that's where we run our site off of. Um, the biggest thanks, probably of all, goes to the people behind the UK site, They Work For You. And this is some of the people that contributed to that website over the course of like four or five years. And, and um, the, all the website code for Open Australia is built on They Work For You. We uh, wrote the parser and scraper that takes all the government data off the website and puts it into the database. We wrote from scratch because that's obviously specific to Australia. Um, so, you know, in many ways, what my society has done is set the benchmark for for what is happening all over the world. You know, in the U.S., um, continuing to happen in the U.K., happening here. You know, um, these these people were doing it really the first. Um, they were for you started uh, about four or five years ago now. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, getting access to the data, which. Um, which is really much harder than it ought to be, right? So that's just getting getting whole, getting our dirty hands on on the on the data from government. Um, then we've got the issue of actually getting permission to republish that data on our website, and that is also much harder than it ought to be. Now, um, when it comes to the 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 original version of the screen scraper um, that wrote um, that this is the original version of of, of the website. And we didn't have access to any of the underlying data. You know, we asked for it, nothing happened. Um, the, 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 the system that ran this thing was incredibly flaky. It would, it would fall over every day virtually. Um, it, some, uh, it was like ASP.NET app of some description with cookies that are like ridiculous. Um, and, and the navigation was entirely cookie based as well, so the, you couldn't like was entirely session based rather. So you couldn't do there weren't any fixed URLs for anything. It was yeah, it's just a world of horrificness. Um, but kind of bash something together. Um, now then it came to permission, right? So we started working on this in November two thousand and seven, and had no idea what what how you know how people would feel about us republishing this, this data right because no nothing as far as I know nothing like this has been done in Australia before so um, just give you a little timeline of getting permission um, first off like at the bottom of the web pages it says you know copyright Commonwealth of Australia like everything just says that right and so you're like okay um, so there was no indication of who we need to get in touch with so we kind of dug around and after a while we found out that there is a there's a, a, an organization that specifically looks after uh, uh, Crown copyright stuff. And, and that's the Commonwealth Copyright Administration. So we got in touch with them in December. We didn't hear anything um, back. This is a sort of typical story of, of for us of getting in touch with government departments. Um, we tried again in January. Um, and then we got a response. So that was good. But they, they went, oh, it, it doesn't actually belong. It's not actually a copyright Commonwealth of Australia. It actually belongs to Parliament House. Like, OK, so the fact that it said copyright Commonwealth of Australia, that, no, no, it's Parliament House that owns the copyright. OK, fine. Um, so we got in touch with Parliament House. They directed us to the web manager. And then the web manager directed us to the web content section. And then the web content section person uh, sent us a reply in an official kind of uh, letter-headed letter that said, you do not require permission to reproduce Hansard extracts as the Hansard report is considered to be public domain material. Now, I'm no lawyer, but as far as I'm aware, copyright, Commonwealth of Australia, public domain, not the same thing. Um, considered to be, okay, well, basically we got permission, but I don't really know what it means, right? Like. Like, we, we, we've been given permission, but it doesn't really make much sense. Um, the, we haven't been given a license that says, you know, it's copyright us, but these are the terms under which you're allowed to use it. We've been given some kind of guidelines, you know, like basically they, they, know, they, they saw the way that we link back to the original source. So, for instance, you know, when you go to any Open Australia debate, 
you'll see uh, the text of a speech, and, and, and for every speech it goes, it will link back to the actual original place on aph.gov.au where that original speech was. Um, so they saw that and they, they approved of that general format, but really other than that, there was no kind of specific license. Um, not great. Um, okay, so on to another bit, right? Um, So you have where you live, which then you know you know your postcode. The postcode will then tell you will then tell you what electoral division you're in, and the electoral division is basically like you know um, is like the area which representatives represent basically. So so you know you, they're 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 kind of yeah the area that that the whole uh, electoral system is split down the middle into these different sections, right? Um, so each so each electoral division has one representative currently sitting. Now, so basically that's the kind of mapping you need to go through that mapping to go from where you live to who your representative is, right? Now that's a pretty fundamental piece of information in terms of the democratic process, right? But that middle bit going from postcode to electoral electoral division is kept very tightly under control by the Australian Electoral Commission. Right. right right, now, you can go to their website and you can type in your postcode and it will give you your electoral division, but they won't give you that data for free, like the entire mapping, right? And that is fundamental to that mapping from where you live to who your representative is, right? So in some sense, they're actually controlling a very important part of kind of, of the electoral process, which is who your representative is. Sorry? Uh, no, but but uh, I would be interesting to to see what would happen. The thing is, they they do actually you can actually buy that data from them for four hundred dollars, right? But that wasn't an option for us. It's like thirty dollars or something. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I it would be interesting. I don't I don't know how that would work. So maybe that would be something to explore. But we found a way around it, and this makes the situation even slightly more farcical, which is that. The, 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 the geodata for the uh, postcode boundaries is freely available from the post office, off of their website. The, uh, the electoral division geo boundaries, uh, as far as I'm aware, are available from, I think, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So you can combine those two data sets to make the postcode to electoral division mapping. And that's what someone did for us. Take two freely de available data sets, combine them into into one, um, and and that's what we use to drive drive the stuff on our website. And since then, we've been contacted by about three different nonprofits to get that data because it's like everybody needs it. Anyone who wants to run a campaign on their website to say, you know, uh, write to your representative about so and so, find out who your representative is by typing in your postcode. You know, it's all really obvious. It's stuff that should just be freely available and isn't right now. So it's it's, I think it's a bad situation. So I'm going to switch back to the the scraping side of things, getting access to the data. Um, October 2008 was, was a complete month of pain because um, out of the blue, well, as far as we knew, we know, out of the blue, um, aph.gov.au decided to completely change their website that shows the Hansard um, to make it much better. <laughs> um, and we asked, you know, to get an early look at this because, you know, we were like, we're doing this and everything we're doing is kind of based on the structure of your website because we've had to scrape it and it's like all really painful, like please help us and like nothing. So finally the thing came live and, and we looked at it and, and it actually looked like this, completely different. Uh, and we were like, okay, this is actually, this is, this is, this is, this is, okay, this is going to be really difficult. It turned out, because the entire structure of everything was different, uh, it turned out that none of these pages even validated, H were not even valid HTML, like the word, like, it was, so it was like the scrape, scraping just became, like, much more painful, you know, when you have tags nests inside of tags that shouldn't be there, and, yeah, anyway. Um, 
So we were like panicking, or I was panicking, and going, oh, what are we going to do? And it was like, please, please put the old website back just for a little bit, just for us. And they were like, oh, okay. You know, but, you know, we're going to do it. We're going to put it on a private URL because we don't want anybody else to know about it because that would be an extra thing to support, right? And they were, and, and, and they were but they were allowing a transition period for people inside Parliament, but not for people outside Parliament, right? So all they were doing were exposing something, a service that they were running internally anyway, just for the outside. Um, anyway, and, and so they gave it to us for, ran it for another week or two, uh, and then there was a break uh, in Parliament for a couple of weeks. And during that time, I kind of worked furiously to try to make it all match up, and then just kept discovering more and more problems. Like, um, text was out of order from the old system to the new system. There was no consistent uh, mapping between uh, headings and, and subheadings. and Like, everything was completely, like, there was some weird kind of magic going on. Like, like, obviously, there was a common source of data, but they were presenting it in a way that was utterly, utterly different. And I couldn't figure out how then the two, you know, you had the old system and then the underlying data and then the new system, and I couldn't figure out that mapping. Like, and so I just had to try to reverse engineer what, their possible logic was in doing stuff. And I got quite far with it, but, you know, ultimately I was hitting barriers where there were things that were just obviously completely wrong, like, and, and, and there was no response to them when I pointed them out, and, and yeah, anyway. So I, it, was, it was getting really painful. Now, uh, then completely out of the blue, um, they said, oh, we might have a solution for you. Okay. And what they did is they added that you say XML. And that was the life saving. <laughs> um, and basically what they did is they gave us access to the underlying uh, XML data that they used themselves internally to, to generate both the printed version of the Hansard and the online version, right? And this is something I had asked for months before. And it turned out, I, look, I don't know what led them to do this. Um, but I get the inkling that there were a few other groups involved who, who, were, who were wanting something similar, and they ultimately um, caved in and did this. And, you know, the truth is, I'm sure it was incredibly simple to do. But this was actually pretty, you know, this is pretty amazing what they did, right? It's pretty, because what they've done is opened up some really fundamental bit of data and made it a whole lot easier, right? It's far from perfect. Like, there's tons of problems with the XML. There's no schema. <laughs> Um, it, it's changed. Uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, yeah. Well, that, that's a whole other thing in of itself. But basically, they made a massive, massive step forward with this, and 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 then it was pretty straightforward to to write to, to basically take that file and and rejig it into the XML format that we use that gets sucked into the database at our end. Um, so yeah. So there's that. Now. Uh, talk a little bit about the register of interests. Um, the register of interests is, yeah, that, that document says, you know, what, what people, uh, uh, what potential things might influence them outside of parliament that might some, in un, some undue way influence their decision, right? So people have to say, you know, what memberships of clubs and associations they have, you know, if they've received big gifts from a, 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 a company or, you know, they've been upgraded from, you know, business class to first class on a, on a flight, that they have to declare that stuff. Um, and and uh, we, we kind of, we, you know, when we started Open Australia, we, 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 we kind of knew that this thing existed and we were like, you know, looking for it online and, and <laughs> poking around and we were like, you can't find this thing anywhere. <laughs> it's just nowhere. And we're like, well, is this crazy? You know, I don't, I don't understand. Um, maybe it's another one of those things where their website isn't being indexed, and you know, I can't find it. But, um, but ult we spent a, a while looking for it, and then ultimately we got in touch with the registrars, who were the people that look after this this thing, and asked if it was available online. And it turned out it wasn't. Um, it wasn't available online, and it wasn't even available in any electronic form. It, it, it only existed in an office in Canberra that you could visit like between 10 and 12 and 2 and 4 in the afternoon on days when Parliament sits. Uh, and you'd have to go to this office and there's 1,500 pages of loose leaf A4 paper that have been handwritten 
my handwritten filled in forms, right? That look a bit like this. Um, and that is the official record, right? And that official record is there for everybody to see and to hold everybody accountable to. But but if that if that record isn't like easily available to like normal people, then then is that really freely available? I mean, so so our aim was okay. Well, how can we put that stuff online? And and so we've taken the first step to that, and um, we got. Uh, we got sent the whole lot, 1,500 copies of the 1,500 pages for both the, the uh, House of Representatives and the Senate, and someone scanned that for us, and we put it all up on, on, on the website as, a, as, as PDF split up by person. Um, but, but here's the thing. We, we have absolutely no idea what the copyright situation with this document is, nor any licensing situation, right? So basically what happened is we got in touch with the people responsible for this thing. We said, you know, um, have a look at our website. We run this website called Open Australia. Um, we intend to scan this document and put it online for everyone to see. And then they sent it to us, right? And we said, can we have, what are the copyright situations? You know, can we have a license, blah, blah, blah. Is it okay to republish? Do we have permission? They never answered any of those questions, but they just sent it to us, right? So they sent it to us knowing full well what we were going to do. So we kind of have an implied license there. And I, I, I sort of, I sat, I, the funny thing is I kind of, I, I, I gave a very, very teeny version of this talk to a bunch of um, copyright lawyers um, in, in a recent conference in, um, in Sydney. And, and, and they were like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You know, don't worry about it too much. Like, so, you know, personally, I would like this stuff to work as simply as you know, using open source software, right? When you when you get open source software, right? You 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 look at it. You look up a project. And you go to the project page, and then you download the software, and you have the source code for everything. You have the data, and then there's a license that comes with it. It says, okay, this license. This is what I'm allowed to do with this license, and these are my responsibilities to uphold this license, right? So it, it's telling me everything I need to know. It gives me the data, it says what I have to do, and it says what I'm allowed to do with it. Why can't all government data be like as simple as that? And there's no reason it needs to be any more difficult. Government data is much simpler. It's all public No, no. In the US it is. In the US it's all public domain. Here it's not. Here it's crown copyright. Like, and crown copyright they can do. They can basically put whatever conditions they want on that data. Now, there's some there's some agencies that have been very progressive. And for instance, the Australian Bureau of Statistics have recently like uh, created Commons, an enormous amount of their data, right? Um, so so you have a, a very you know there's still copyright associated with that, but they've given you a license to reuse that data in a very specific way under the Creative Commons. But but in most cases, you know, with government data, at least in Australia, there's there's, there's very little in the way of real, real uh, specific guidance about what you're allowed to do with the stuff. But, but you, have to, you have to cause damage. As if you would violate the copyright, for them to have a claim on you, you would have to cause damage. Now, the data has been created for the government by you know, funds provided by taxpayers. It's going to be very difficult for them to bring you to court for them. I, I, I hope that's the case, but I don't think it's been tested. <laughs> so, um, the future. Well, um, you know, say again, I guess what we've done so far is really just uh, a beginning, you know. Um, there's a lot of things happening all over the place um, in Australia to, to try to uh, use government data in, in new and interesting ways and also try to force um, government data to be more open. Um, and there's also a big move towards kind of making government more transparent generally. But some of the plans that we have um, are, are to add things like voting information, right? Um, right now, right now, uh, there's no way to find out how, uh, how people voted in Parliament, right, or how parties voted in Parliament, other than actually looking through the Hansard and looking at the names that said A or no against particular bills, right? Um, so, uh, been working on on um, 
another adaptation of a UK site called the Public Whip, which basically collates all that uh, voting information from the Hansard. And, and I'm kind of, we're about three quarters of the way through doing that. Like all the parsing stuff is built um, and it's just getting the, the, the web front end working. And that would basically allow you to, you know, look at, look at how people voted on different bills, um, kind of group those bills into uh, like policy. So you could say, okay, you know, these whole sets of bills, if someone voted, you know, like uh, voted no on this and yes on this and strongly in favor of this and strongly against that, that means that they're uh, in favor of, uh, 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 you know, in favor of uh, a strong uh, defense, say. You know, and you can group those things together and then compare compare whole sets of policies against individual people, right? Now, as I'm sure you're aware, in Australia, like voting is very, 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 very strongly linked to the party that you're in. There's a bit, like, there's almost no people crossing the floor, right? But I don't know how common that knowledge is, right? But if you can see the information right there that says, you know, you look at your MP and it says, this is when they voted for, you know, along with their party, and this is when they, the one time that they voted against their party. That that will tell you something that there's no easy way to do right now, unless you're a complete political junkie, basically. So, so again, hope to bring something, you know, a, a, a kind of give people the the raw material to make their own decisions, and for for people to to really figure out what's going on. Like this is this really what this is all about. Um, I looked at my, my MP and found that he was the, uh, in, in all of the UK Parliament, was the second most uh, likely Labour Party member to vote the party line. Yep. It was about one vote in his history in Parliament where he hadn't voted as the fact told him to. And, and, it tell, and it tells you something about the politician, it tells you something about the person, it tells you, it tells you how much they're representing their area versus their party. You know, and all these things are important for you to make the choice about whether those people are really representing you. Um, so committees right now is something like there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on in, in committees outside of the main chamber that that's really important. And probably the best known of those is like the Senate Estimates Committee that's just been going on. And right now we don't have any of that stuff, right? And that would be really good to get in there because that's that that that's really important stuff. So we like to do that. We like to get much better kind of integration with the bills so so you could like you know when when people vote on something you could actually find out how you know how the how the bills have changed over time and get just get a sense again you know so you could track a particular issue rather than a particular person you know so now you can you can follow what people say but it'd be really good if you can go well I'm interested in in the passage of this particular bill about this thing and I want to see how it progresses right and right now, again, you, you have to be a political junkie to, to follow that stuff. We want to make it so that anybody can do it really easily. We're focusing on federal parliament right now, but we'd like to get all the states and territories in there. Like we've been seeking permission to, 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 uh, to republish the Hansard for, for the states and territories. And right now, um, the ACT has said yes. Um, WA and Victoria have kind of said yes, though we still have to go to the... We have, get the official final approval, and the Northern Territory has said, no, we're not allowed to republish. And we're appealing the Northern Territory decision, um, and we have yet to hear back from them. And with the other states and territories, we're still waiting. Um, we've kind of gotten to varying stages. But all, if you want to follow what's going on, like you can go to, uh, go to our, 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 uh, our bug tracker, tickets.openaustralia.org, and there's tickets for all that, getting permission for each of the states, and you can follow the updates and if you're interested. Is it why? No. No, they all have they, they all have kind of similar concerns about what we're doing. Um, one of the big cons concerns that kind of keeps cropping up is is um, is a thing called privilege, which is um, basically when things in, when things are said in Parliament, they're covered by this notion of privilege. So so essentially, people are allowed to say things in Parliament that they wouldn't be allowed to say things outside of Parliament. So it's it, it's there to kind of allow for free flowing discussion without fear that someone would be sued, basically. So there's a really good valid reason that exists. Now, when you have a transcript of what's said, right, that is covered by privilege as well if certain conditions are met. So if you if you publish the whole lot, it's covered by privilege. So and that's basically what we're doing. So we're fine. 
But like in the case of, you know, if you're a journalist and you're quoting someone, what someone said in Parliament, if that quote is taken out of, out of context then, in a way that sort of, you know, um, gives a misleading impression of what they said, then it's not covered by privilege. And then the person, I think, yeah, the person republishing it can get into trouble, essentially. So, so they've been kind of talking about that, and we've gone, oh, no, that's not a problem because we're publishing the whole lot. And then they go, oh, why can't you just link to us? And it's like, no, 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 because we're doing this because we want to make it all easier and we want to get the content. And, you know, and that's how we're kind of moving these days. Um, and so there's a lot, of, a lot of explaining. You know, we're not dealing necessarily with tech-savvy people that are making the final decision. So, so it's just a bit of toing and froing. And I, I, I'm fairly confident we'll get there. You know, it's not necessarily easy, and it's very time-consuming. How, how long has it been that we've been doing the state? thing for like it's been oh it's been longer than that isn't it? okay but well it's been a good I, I at least at least six months that the whole process has been going on so um, you know and you can't just kind of put in a request and wait for it to come back it's just a continual ping them you know get through to the right person annoy them you know to the point that they'll answer you and so forth so um, Okay, one of the a really big thing we'd like to get going is to add video to everything. So now this is a potentially huge project, um, but would be absolutely awesome if you could like you know follow what someone says and then not only read the transcript but just watch what they said in Parliament. Um, so that's a kind of little mock-up of you know what, what it would be like. And um, there's a bit of you know there's a the copyright situation there is unclear. Um, there's it's it, yeah. It's a gray area. What exactly? What exactly the rights are in terms of reusing that material? Like um, uh, there's 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 fair use, um, which allows you to take, you know, take snippets, and you know if you're a journalist, you can use things to report the news. And there's a specific part of the Copyright Act, in my understanding, that relates to using something for news. Um, but we don't we don't fit that because we're we're republishing the whole lot. So, so, so the question is, how can we make this happen? It's, it, it seems, you know, anybody, anybody you talk to, it seems really, really obvious that this should be possible, right? Like we should be allowed to do this, right? It's about what people in Parliament are saying. They're there to represent us. You know, this should happen. So we just need to figure out how, um, and you know. Um, there are many ways, and I'm sure you know if there was someone from Google that was interested in this, um, that would be perfect. You know, um, there's lots of ways in which um, different organizations could get involved in doing something like this, and it would benefit a lot of different people to have that kind of source of material available for everyone. Um, so, just one last thing, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so, with the bills. You know, it'd be great if you could, you know, track bills as they as they progress around. So, you know, you could you could kind of um, see them move between houses. You could watch the votes. You could see the amendments happening, or even just you know go back to a historical bill and see the progression that goes on. Because right now, um, if you're if you're a lawyer, even um, they, you know, there, there's there's like. Uh, they pay people to specifically track the, the, the progression of bills so that they go, okay, on this date, what, was, what did the bill look like and how did it change over time? And it's very hard in many cases, even for lawyers, to, to unpick the history of a bill. And right now, so it's like we need reverse control for bills, right, basically. So, so that's, yeah, that's it. <laughs> and that's my Twitter, if you like Twitter. So um, any questions? Um, in terms of funding um, and not for profit, it, it certainly sounds like all of those would be very interesting. Um, if if um, you said we could be providing um, all that materials mm -hmm. for the person who came to the house to say, I mean, sorry, it, it's just, just yeah. a side. But, uh, but my main question is um, what you focus here is on here is largely like transparency. Um, I guess the point has been that um, across what the year um, in area, um, and I'm assuming that you make sure that you can take this as an understanding of that. The responses that you get back are often very substandard. Um, and so 
So, so your question was um, being concerned about the, the 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 transparency of the communication with with MPs and also the accountability that they have, in a sense. Yeah, I mean, to talk about like, let's just go by example. You know, let's say I'm sort of long issue, um, say, and you know, it's a Yeah, I think the, the, there's a couple. I guess there's a couple of different ways you could look at it, and 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 we'd like to kind of approach both things. Um, there's one uh, there's one effort uh, underway by a completely unrelated group of people to us um, called Tweet MP, who who've set up a, a basically a, a, a um, aggregation engine for tweets from from MPs, and also a way to kind of push. Uh, politicians into using Twitter um, for the purposes of actually having a transparent form of communication. Um, I think there's a lot of benefit in doing something like that, um, uh, but I don't think that's the the only the only approach. I think that's uh, that you need to take kind of several strands, and I think the other approach that that we'd like to try as well. Um, is is uh, to to build a service where you can easily write to your MP through the website, right? But with one extra thing, right? And that and that is that you can you can actually record how often people are either satisfied with the answer or get a reply at all, right? So and and then you know in that page where we have the statistics about the MPs, you can just show that there. So you you don't in any way kind of um, uh, uh, get in the way of the privacy of that communication, but you, in some way, make on a sort of on a on a statistical level, you make the the politician accountable to reply to people and to give them satisfactory answers. And 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 then you know you can point and, and you can, and someone can write their MP and go, I see you know I see on Open Australia that that most people are aren't satisfied with your answer, and I'm not satisfied with your answer. Like, give me you know, like. I know I know you're not just conning me, like you're conning a whole bunch of other people. Or, alternatively, you find out that your MP is fantastic at replying and that they haven't replied, and you know, okay, there must be something on. I'll, you know, I'll deal with them politely and you know, respectfully, and and wait until that they re respond to my query. You know? So, I think just that transparency is important on all levels. I think to allow to allow decent communication, you know, decent, intelligent reasonable communication to take place. Any other questions? Have you had any response from the people whose words you're making hands on the politicians? Um, have we had any response from the politicians? Um, uh, yes, yes we have. Um, uh, it's been very variable though. So, so the funny thing is, um, we've had we, we know, for instance, that an enormous number of people uh, in who work at Parliament House or who work for government departments are using our service, right? So we know that getting email alerts and stuff like that, and we one of our blog posts just kind of shows that. And it's a quarter of our email alerts come from come from gov.au, right? Um, and we've had enormous uh, no, we've had a a, a fairly sizable communication from people who work in the offices of representatives or senators. But we've had very, very little communication directly from uh, the politicians themselves. In fact, very few politicians right now have actually even publicly recognized what we're doing. Now, I don't know why that is, because we know, we know through a you know, whole bunch of sources that people are using our service, right, within government. With the you know the advisors to politicians are using our service, but they're not.